Da Vinci, I think? Yes, I'm sure it was Da Vinci. Well, now it's a famous story. Slava Makarov was in the kitchen and suddenly he had an idea. I think it was Pyotr Pitikov who suggested the idea that it should be tanks. History is silent. Slava Makarov, no idea. There are many versions. Some say it was Pyotr Bitukov, Serb. I wasn't there at the time. No, I don't believe the other stories. I think it was Pyotr's suggestion. This is what happened. It was early 2008. We were finishing our work on Order of War for Square Enix. This is the Western version of Operation Migration. It became obvious that it was time for us to back off from single-player games and create an MMO game. The internet in the country was developing rapidly. The number of potential users was growing, and the quality of computers people had was improving. So there was an obvious demand for that. The second question was what setting should we choose? Trends at the time were quite standard. Fantasy, online. This genre prevailed, many games chose this setting. We wanted to do the same because many of those who worked on this had played these types of games. So we didn't move beyond this paradigm and started doing what everyone else did. The general opinion was, well, it's an MMO and this means fantasy. In people's minds, the idea was something like a very simple Overwatch, to the extent the existing technologies allowed. But it was impossible to create a good project like this back then. And there was no sense in doing it poorly, because the market was overfilled with different games in the fantasy genre. So Piotr and I knew at this point we needed to change Victor's mind and start doing something drastically different. At the time, we actively played Navy Field. It was a Korean game. So we thought, why don't we try to mix our experience in vehicles and units from our RTS experience with the idea of a massively multiplayer session game like that Korean one. It was clear that a game about ships would be too expensive. The models were very difficult to replicate. Another big task about them would be to create water and to do it well. But it wasn't really possible back then. We mentioned planes, we mentioned walking robots, but the opinion was it might be a success, but maybe it will flop. That's why we abandoned the idea of ships, and also spaceships, for almost the same reason. And the best win-win option, the most interesting, was an option I suggested. In that particular chat, I think it was me who wrote about the tanks first. I suggested it. I think it was me. Hmm. Anyway, everyone liked the idea. This is how it all started. We agreed on how the game should look and the basic approach we should take on it. Then we needed to set up a meeting with Victor. Of course, it took more than one meeting. Before that, I'd been to Pyotr's place many times when I was in Moscow. We drank tea and talked about games, about what wargaming should do next. Obviously, I showed him our orcs and elves who could already run around and even fight a bit. But Pyotr, he belonged to some secret, very exclusive club of orc and elves haters. So every time he tried to suggest a different idea, like robots and so on. So it came down to tanks in a very natural way. I said to Slava and Victor, meet me at my place. So finally, in December 2008, I met Slava Makarov at Pyotr's apartment for the first time, and we talked tanks for the first time. I don't know this story. I thought you'd actually ask where the World of Tanks title came from? Pass. Next question. Himmelsdorf? I know, but I won't tell you. Himmelsdorf? Well, it's probably kind of a collective name. Well, it's an old story from Serb. It's just a name, it's not a real place. I honestly don't know. Himmelsdorf? No idea. At one point, I used to visit a military history forum. And something Dorf was a collective name for small German towns or villages. Like near something Dorf, there was a battle. The Germans announced their great victory again and rolled 30 more kilometers back to Berlin. So, correspondingly, something Dorf, well, it wasn't quite suitable for a name. 
So we replace something with Himmel, which means sky. It was very convenient to talk about tanks at Piotr's place. Along the whole wall, he had a glass door cabinet filled with vehicle models. You just sit there, and there are tank models, plastic, glued together, and well painted, rows and rows of them. And I say, look, here's a tank, it has this turret. And here's another model of the same tank, but made in another year with a different turret. Additionally, you can equip it with other guns. It was the T-34, so that's how we get what we call progression. And at the same time, they're real historical vehicles. And you understand, it's tanks, yes. I think all positive karmic forces united there. You can say we got lucky. Marat, Slava, Sergei Berkatovsky and I were all physicists. So we spoke the language of reason, common sense and logic. That evening, Slava delivered a very long lecture about how he saw tanks, what would be there, who could shoot at whom and why this would work. As people with critical thinking, we asked him a load of leading questions, and he answered all of them, bam, 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 with very lively responses. He drew some things, and he stood up and explained other things with his body language. The final decision hadn't been taken yet, but everyone was very interested. Victor asked for a detailed document and to have another meeting. We agreed with him that I'd further elaborate the concept. We met in Moscow and discussed once again. Now I find myself thinking that all these nice things we have in World of Tanks, even today, Slava explained almost every little thing to us back then. Of course, there were doubts, there were questions. Then we quashed all doubts and moved forward. I think this was the moment the project formed. A fantasy game was being created, and then everything was stopped at a stage that was much further from the initial one and drastically changed in favor of the tanks project. To this day, this is an unbelievable story for me. Not every manager is ready to take such a risk, and many thought this project might not be a success. A game about tanks similar to the game about ships. Probably no one would think back then that it was something awesome. There were just no such games. No, it's not about faith, it's about determination. Victor made a decision, went all in, and won. Many people think it was reckless, but at the time, I had some experience, and I had a responsible approach to life. 120 people believed in me at that moment. I promised them a bright future. So did my family, my mother, and my father who works with me to this day. It was not a reckless thing. Of course, there were risks. This is the gaming industry. It comes with risk. You need to make a game first, and only then it could either be a hit or a flop. But first of all, I believe in my team, battle-hardened warriors who worked together for five, six, or even a decade as one team. In our portfolio, we had the second Massive Assault, Massive Assault Network, Galactic Assault. We made Operation Bagration, Order of War. This is a game almost at the level of total war. I knew our Minsk guys would pull through. Whatever mission they had, graphics, maps, technologies, we'll do it. Of course, before we hadn't had such an accurate idea as Slava suggested. It's when the final piece of the puzzle was added. Kudos to Slava and kudos to Sergei. They explained to me and Misha Zhivietz very logically why this would work and answered the questions we threw at them. Well, to me, first of all. I asked them tons of questions, and not only in Moscow, but also later when we started work. The first drafts, concepts, the first design documents. We drank tea and coffee and discussed everything, and they were explaining everything. This was a well-calculated risk, I'd say, but it was still a huge risk. On my side, it was like this. Victor invited me to meet him in late December, right before New Year. 
there was Slava Makarov. Victor said, here's a guy with an interesting concept. What do you think? So they told me about this concept. I was thinking the whole day and then compiled a list of 10 or 12 points where I explained why this project wouldn't launch. I came back to Victor and he and Slava persuaded me everything would be okay. It also worked out very well for me. I had already been keen on the history of World War II and tanks. He said something like, well, I like tanks. It was all interesting to me. So they talked me around and we started making tanks instead of elves. We talked to Misha and several other leading co-workers. So I gathered all war gamers in one room. Back then, we could fit in one room. And delivered a passionate, bright, and even somewhat solemn speech. Its meaning was roughly like this. Guys, massive assault, order of war, migration, it's all good. But we need to abandon all this single-player stuff. We've already got a bit of a handle on the technology, so that's it. We're doing an MMO game. And, surprise, surprise, it's about tanks. It was a deafening silence. And then someone said, Fuck. It stuttered a lot on my laptop. The first version was truly awful. I played a couple of battles and got hooked. I think I got stuck in the textures. Perhaps it was the first version with the garage. It was a rush through the center. I remember I researched the KV-1, a kind of demolition machine, at the time. And, of course, I was immediately destroyed. Later, I was told it was the first version with the garage. Before that, there was no garage at all, just a sort of some cubes and polygons. The third time I joined a battle, I was sitting in bushes. No one shot at me, but I was of no use to anyone. I've still got the 0.1 beta exe file on my computer. Maybe one day we deploy a local server just to see how things were back then. The first version, from which I have screenshots somewhere, was when we implemented a tank from Order of War. I think it was the T-34. We put it into the engine with elves. That's why the tank ran like an elf at first and casted fireballs for some time. And then after we properly remade the engine, the first version appeared. It wasn't that fun because you couldn't crush elves with the tank. But the vehicle itself was a lot of fun. For some time, it became sort of our trademark. We started believing in this project quickly. After finishing a couple of updates for Square Enix, we readjusted to make tanks, like this. Zip, and here we go. The mechanism itself, the MMO nature of the game, remained. So did the network technology and the multi-user capability. The genre changed, of course. There were a few people, people who made decisions. There were a few of them, too. Almost everyone was sitting in one room, except for Victor. But it didn't take long to talk to him, to just go to the next room, so the decisions were made almost immediately. I almost said little by little. In fact, it was very fast. I mean it. The guys and girls were just killing it. There's no other word. During the development, I was a technical director and then a leading game designer. It was just that I picked up everything that wasn't nailed down and nailed it down so that everything worked well. And in turn, I focused on the vehicle tank trees. We needed to understand how many vehicles there were, what content there would be, and so on. So we were constantly discussing this with Piotr Bidyukov, because we had to prepare for making tanks. I would take reference books and write out what guns were mounted on a certain tank, how its armor changed, what radio sets and observation devices were used. I wrote it all out to understand what we could make researchable in the game and what would be superfluous or too complicated. At some point, I started reading the documents, and I literally exploded because I thought it was all complete nonsense. I sent a very, very long email to Victor along the lines of, we can't live like this. Then I talked to Victor, 
and we discussed what we could do for a while. Finally, it ended up with summoning Sergei Burkarkovsky to the game design realm. Let's say I had appreciated these vehicles for a long time. I was a regular on a military history forum, so I used to develop tool sets for different command and staff games, including the ones connected with tanks. I was pretty familiar with this subject, and yes, it was very interesting, because my family lived in Moscow. So I came home one day and I said, hey, I was offered a job in Minsk. Unfortunately, I won't be able to come home every week, but every two weeks. Well, my wife is a wise woman, and she asked me, do you like the project? I said, yes, the project is awesome. Well, she said, go then. And we started working very quickly. Sergi and I, we had similar opinions about what we should do and where we would go. Basically, he followed the project from the very beginning. I kept him informed. That's where we did everything very quickly. All initial rules of armor penetration, visibility, practicality, they were mostly born in his mind. Additionally, he has a tough stance, which was also important, because sometimes people hesitate and don't know what decision to take and start looking for a compromise. And he can say firmly that it should be done like this, and he can prove it. This is very important as well. Sergei did an amazing job. I mean, the game designed his task to make tanks, it's gigantic. And many couldn't do it. The thing is that we were making completely new inroads. We were trailblazers, so we had to come through all those thorns, ravines, crevasses, and so on. You don't count problems on your way, you overcome them. In fact, everything was okay. Sergei and Slava, they are very clear and professional, true geniuses. And wargaming was up to par as well. Our guys were skilled. Everything went fast. We had well-established processes. Everything worked smoothly. It all became clear since when the closed beta started and we gathered applications. The first results went according to the feasibility study. Slava basically wrote on a napkin. We counted conversion. We knew how many players who had started playing in the closed beta continued to play the closed beta. We could form a confident hypothesis that in the open beta, when the product quality would be better, there would be more retention mechanisms and conversion would be better as well. Then we built a mathematical model which gave certain predictions about the number of players online. So, we actually drew a curve already at the closed and open beta stages. Everything was clear in general. Did we know how it would look like in the end? Well, of course we knew and calculated some things. Everything we calculated did happen, but anything else that happened was the so-called word of mouth. It's like James told Sam, Sam told his brother, that brother told everyone at his school, and all those boys, teenagers, and adult men started playing our game. Whole clans moved from other games, Counter-Strike, EVE Online, and so on. We didn't expect such a large scale. It was like being hit by a tsunami. I don't know how to say it. We did or we didn't. We predicted the initial stage quite accurately. The final stage, not so much. We started preparing this to the extent our funds allowed us. The funding situation was very bad. Tanks were indeed made using the last coins. By the end of the project, we put everything we could and even more into it. About a month before the release, we completely ran out of money. And I mean it. It's true. A big fat zero in our account. My mother even took our last savings, took what was left, and gave it to me. With tears. And this brings me tears right now as well. I remember a good old pal of mine arrived on his scooter, took off his helmet, and literally gave me a sack with crinkled notes and said, I'm sorry, this is as much as I can give. I thanked him and took it. So, with the help from our friends, we managed to last that month. We survived somehow.
I remember this day clearly. Actually, it's written in history. And that day, there was a massive water flood in Minsk. Trolley buses floating. So, I was late to the office, and we had our first test with people from outside the office. We gathered history buffs. There were five to six people. I knew some of them. So, I rush into the office, and they are playing already. And I look at them. And they are so glad. Go left, let's go, load, hide, fall back. Oh, damn! They were so excited. And then a thought ran through my head. This is the end. If what we've done is awesome for these guys, normal people will never like it. So I walk up to Sergei and say, well, that's it. It's a flop. Let's pack our stuff. And he says, no, you didn't get it. This is really, really good. I said, what do you mean? They're nerds. Who's going to play it if these guys like it? And he explained to me in a very scientific way that this was the core of our community. That they would read forums. They knew this topic. They would give advice and defend our game. And they would bring more nerds themselves. Then all this would spread around the internet, and they would become the stable core of our community. And this is exactly what happened indeed. The release was a climax of everything that had been going on. We crossed our fingers. We already knew it was a win. We saw that grown men who work and have a wife, kids, a car, already got a kick out of the game. We already had several meetings where they said, damn guys, well done, it's so awesome. So we knew we wouldn't screw up. I mean, yeah, we had the data showing we had good conversion. Like, this is a math model, so everything should be okay. But it was still very frightening. You could say that the game launch was a leap of faith. We were sure in our heads, but it still felt <laughs> There were troubles with servers at release, with everything working for everyone, with network load, with databases. We needed to put it all together, and from the outside, you looked at all this like, well, well, it all must turn on and work. We promised people, and that's how it went. At the same time, we were answering on the farm why we had delayed the release, what was happening, why the server was still down, and people were eagerly waiting to play. And then everything is up. Everything works. Countless number of players rush to the server, and you think, oh damn, it all works. And suddenly, we did well. The time was perfectly right for it as well. Five years earlier or five years later, it wouldn't have had the same effect. That moment was the right time to do it. It was a huge relief that it finally worked and didn't crash and burn right away. People started flooding in, the scale began to grow. At first it was like, phew! This brings not only an excitement, this brings passion. Like, here we go. It's a chance. Hit it, and you score. That was the feeling. I probably slept the whole week after. And now, yes, let's keep on working. It should be non-stop. We couldn't let it go. Then we scratched our heads and realized that we passed the first stage. But we weren't going to stop. And so it went on and on and on. Roughly speaking, we didn't have time to deploy more servers. I mean, people barely managed to log in during the peak times because we just couldn't add more server capacity as fast as people came to the game. Hmm. Good question. The mouse was, well, okay. I don't know. Because, rush the center. Most likely, no. I don't even want to think up an answer. It's the perfect armored vehicle of World War II. So we tried rushing the center and the mouse. I don't know. Probably it was the biggest. It really stood out among the other tanks and could just roll them over. Because it's slow, it's convenient for Victor to play it. It looks menacing. Well, the question is not that I married it or my father was the mouse. 
Sure, it's big, made of steel, heavy. It has a gun almost like a naval one. How could you not love it? There's a story how my love of the mouse began. Marat and I were in San Francisco. We already launched the alpha or beta version, but there was no mouse yet. The mouse was still unavailable. It was in the game, but you could activate it only using a special code that Marat and I had. Well, Bender said we couldn't do it. But we said, let's try. So, bam, we spawned two mouses and simultaneously pressed the battle button on our laptops. Like in the famous Pushkin poem, now march, and calmly, not yet seeking, to aim, at steady, even pace, the foes, cold-blooded and unspeaking, each took four steps across the space. So there we were. The allies all went, holy smokes! The chat exploded. We agreed with Marat not to fire at smaller tanks, only at each other, a duel. And what happened? Everyone went crazy and started destroying us. I mean, our own teams were shooting at us, both. The chat was booming. They began to coordinate at once. And I remember that Hetzer shouting, literally shouting in the chat, guys, I'll hold him back. He just rolls past me and throws himself under my tracks. Everyone was firing from all directions. It was like a hotel bell, ding, ding, ding. They couldn't penetrate. And you sit in the mouse and understand, it's the mouse. We used to talk on forums and chat, and when everyone gathered, I, Sergi, other people, no one wanted to stop doing it, because it's nice. You communicate with people. You need to understand what atmosphere it was back then. Kind of funny business mess. We talk to the first players as to our friends, like, hello, blockheads. You say this to them, right? And it's like a conversation among your friends. No one gets offended. I think the thing is that we have never felt ourselves like big shots. I still don't feel like a big boss, thank goodness. And I still argue with people on Facebook from time to time. You come home, turn on your computer, read comments, before sleep, in the morning, before work, all the time. It took a lot of time. I don't know how much time I spent on this, but a lot. So we communicated the way we could. They asked something, you answer. They asked some nonsense, you tell them it's nonsense. Did you mess with RNG, random number generator? I can't hit any target. Who needs you, my dear? You're messing with the RNG. We didn't do it. Why do we need this? How do I know? Well, I didn't give a command to mess with RNG. Go see the doctor, okay? Heal your megalomania. Or you start arguing about some technical details. Sometimes you admit you were wrong. Sometimes you persuade people. Sometimes you keep to your own opinions. It was cool. I really liked it. This was a part of all things that were happening, why everything happened exactly like this. We never separated ourselves from the audience. A lot was learned from the communication with our players, and this influenced the game greatly. Whatever many said, like, why is that? We speak, but no one listens. We listened a lot, and we still listen a lot today. We and our players are the same, but the people who came first were the fans of World of Tanks and tank history. I've been to the Kubinka Museum many times, and they went there many times. How do you speak with them in an official tone in your suit, talking big? You just can't. You dug in deep. Serb's hand file? Serbi's hand file. I think it came up somewhere in Live Journal. On the forum, of course. I think players made it up. And I'm not sure how it appeared. But I remember the moment it emerged in everyday use. Everyone caught up quite fast. Serb talked about it himself. Perhaps it's connected with a certain tank. How do people perceive a tank being nerfed? Like some parts of it are cut with a hand file. It's like the tanks are filed down at night. Correspondingly, Serb comes with his hand file and removes pieces of our favorite tanks. Players, well, honestly, they were a kind of... Eagles! 
Excuse me, I hope you bleep it out in the video, but that's exactly what they were. They took an industrial thickness gauge, went to the Kubinka Museum, and then started measuring the front armor plate thickness right in front of a stunned old lady who was watching this garage. I think it was the thickness of the IS-7's lower glacius plate. There were some problems with it. And someone said it was Serp who crept into Kubinka at night and sawed off the extra thickness with his hand file. That's where it came from. By the way, I still have a hand file on a stand on my desk. You know, like a stand for a samurai sword. No sword, just a hand file. A massive breakthrough for us was the French vehicles that basically brought the first special type of gameplay. Another mode of firing. They changed the game significantly. Of course, I was waiting for the French autoloaders. Everyone was. I whistled La Marseillaise for half a year. So we went to Paris, rented a hotel there, a conference hall, gathered all the French media to present the French tanks to them. They were a little bit puzzled, perhaps. So everyone gathered and sat down. And I decided to show off a bit. I turned on the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love, that starts like... Love, love, love. So I address them. Dear Mesdames and Messieurs, we just listened to a song about love. And there was La Marseillaise at the beginning. This means we will talk about something loved by the French. We are wargaming and we make world of tanks. So there will be love. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the French tanks. And then the AMX-13 rushes into the screen. Bang. The autoloader goes bam, bam, bam. La Marseillaise, the tricolore. Applause. Curtain falls. Beautifully presented. To this day, this is one of my favorite updates. Of course, update 1.0 is very important to us and it's a nice update all around. But there were other important and good updates. But the French will remain in our hearts forever. Another big story for me was the global map launch. Because the global map was epic. I mean, if we remember how it was, we had a dominant clan in the CIS. Then someone fought back, or this clan got owned. They run around with foul language coming from another clan. This was real action. You know, like street football. Ten people playing five versus five, twenty more just stand nearby and cheer them on. This is how that very global map was back then. There was a feeling of a constantly growing number of players online. Servers were creaking under this heavy load. There was a feeling that we did it. We made a game that people liked. Not only we liked it, but players liked it as well. Basically, we created a new genre. Something like a slow-paced shooter. Our core player's age was 30 and above. Adult men whose fingers move a bit slower. But they have mental prowess, and they feel this game is for them. This is the first point. The second point is this layer of tank culture. We raised it up and enriched it. World of Tanks is not just a game. It is a cultural phenomenon. Just like successful TV shows, like The Simpsons or South Park. They run for 20 to 30 years already, right? And they will go on. World of Tanks is like football. Football is more than 100 years old, and it becomes better year on year. Teams on the pitch. You want to watch every game. Broadcasts, cameras, commentators, football kits, club history. It's just awesome. The same will happen with Tanks. We released Update 1.0 last spring. We laid the foundation for our technical base. I know the plans. There's a whole bunch of them. The team is ready for action. We strengthened and expanded it. World of Tanks is now made in Kiev as well. Just wait for it. Prepare yourselves. Tanks by the bucket load will be coming over the next 10 to 20 years. You gonna finish off the Type 5 Heavy or not? Or you need help? Reloading. Five seconds. That's it. Artillery. Well done, Artie. He's been dealt with. The grill rolls out and now has 429 HP less. It seems this mob is gonna roll out. Oh. It will be bad and painful. Take this. We haven't even got there, and it's fun already. I've just been hit by Artie. They're shooting from the back. Wait, so these guys, I'm trying to run ahead of them. I see you're already punishing someone on the hill. That's good. 515 damage to the light tank. Ouch. Yep. Light tank destroyed. Wow, the bat chat woke up. You saw it? Just two of us against everyone. 
<laughs> that guy got hit at the very last moment. That's nice. Eight to six. Guys, it's eight to six. We're winning. Well, listen, we're basically the old guard, especially me. And it's a win. It's a well-deserved, hard-fought victory. I got 11 bonds. The devs are generous. Yep. Or else Slava Makarov will come and rework the matchmaker. You know, I'm a genuinely happy man. Games are a part of my life. I play them a lot. I mean tanks, ships, blitz. I play Civilization in Clash Royale with my wife. We often play in a platoon with my son. We play Fortnite as well. It's not like I'm living some life and just play games from time to time. It has come together. And I also develop these games. For me, World of Tanks gives the same joy as when a child is born. But this is just the start. Your child starts growing, and you keep on living a full life, and you enjoy it every day. You can remember a lot of situations and things when it was hard, but they're your child and it's cool to be around. You brought them up. My son is already studying hard at university. So what? Will you say any bad things about him? Will you say you're burned out emotionally? Yes, there are difficult times, but it's your own flesh and blood. I feel the same about World of Tanks. It hooked me from the start and never let go. I love tanks dearly. They are big, heavy steel. I have played since the Alpha Test all these years without any significant breaks. This is the cause you've given the biggest part of your life to. Tanks are for life. This is how they were and still are. 